So wait, now we lost Yagesh completely. He said he'd be Maybe right he's... back. Okay. And so how is up. everybody today on that note? Good morning, uh, pretty... morning y'all. Yeah, uh, very good morning. Um, yes. Yeah. 1 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for staying up with us. <laughs> yeah, great. Hey, Sherry, where are you based? I'm in uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, and I'm in the classroom right now. So. And you're in where? I'm in my classroom right oh, now. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. And Melissa, are you in Nebraska still? I am in Nebraska still. Yep, Yay. sitting in my kitchen right now. So. Woohoo! Hoping the Huskers get their first win. We're still waiting. <laughs> Very painful for the entire state. Mm -hmm. Much so. <laughs> All Where right. are you, Ashley? I'm in Dallas, Texas. Oh, great. Okay, cool. Cool. And, and Steve, where are you located? I am in New Jersey. Awesome. Yay. But, I, yeah. <laughs> but I'm a little jealous of Sherry. I'm a big fan of Colorado. Oh. Uh, <laughs> for sure. And Malaysia. Haven't been to Malaysia. I'm sure it's beautiful. Yeah, it's uh, very beautiful. It's uh, 30, well, it's 26 degrees here. It's quite cold this evening, but, um, you know, we'll... Uh, I survived. <laughs> the struggle is real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I know we're waiting on Yogesh. I know he said he'd be right back, but oh, there he is. Yogesh, are you here? Oh, oh almost. Oh, almost. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, I have a feeling he'll come back. Don't worry. Now it is. Do we have our audience here yet? I'm kind of yes, confused. I'm we pretty do. sure we do. Okay. Hello. Uh, we are live on Facebook. So, yes. Right. Hey, Facebook. Okay. All right. So let's do this. Um, Yogesh, you with us at least by, by voice? Dun, dun, dun. All right, well, I, I think we'll, if everybody's up for it, we'll get started and we'll hope that Yogesh uh, j gets uh, figured out and, and, and joins us both with video and audio as soon as he can. Uh, but. We are very excited to be here, and I'm very grateful for all the hard work of, uh, you know, Michael, Tim, and the uh, the Connected Educator Appreciation Day team because uh, watching them work behind the scenes has been pretty awesome uh, in terms of the hard work that's gone into this day. So, big shout out to them, and I'm super excited to be talking to to this crew. Uh, many of which I have not communicated with much. So I think I have as much to, to learn as I do to, uh, to share. And it's going to be great to sit back and, and, and just have a chat. So I've got my coffee here. Hope everybody else does. And we can just uh, kind of enjoy a casual conversation. Uh, definitely to our audience, please uh, you know, post any questions or comments in the chat. Uh, I would like to think that we can kind of diverge from the from the formal questions of the panelists to get at what uh, the audience is interested in. But to start out, uh, we are here to talk about gamification in the classroom. And that may look very different to many of us. Uh, so that is why I'm excited to hear everybody's perspective. Uh, my name is Steve Isaacs. I teach game design and development at a middle school in New Jersey. So I'm immersed in games all around. So for me, you know, I'm tied very closely with game-based learning as well as gamification. And I know some of the things we're gonna address is even the difference between the two. Um, so, you know, please realize that the words are, are not the same. And uh, from there, you know, so, uh, you know, I'll get to some more later, but what I would really like to do is introduce my co-host, Ashley, Coach Ashley Steele, and uh, let her introduce herself. And then we'll hear a little bit about our, our awesome international panel. Hey, I'm Ashley or coach or whatever you decide to call me. I respond mm -hmm. to everything. Um, I am currently in a cookie baking context with Steve because we're going to bake cookies and send them to everyone else. Yeah. Um, I am an eighth grade physics teacher in Dallas, Texas. I teach at magnet school. Um, I use gamification in my classroom to hopefully make physics a little bit more understandable for students who are learning algebra at the same time. So I'm a huge fan of trying to make learning as fun as possible and make you not realize you're learning. So I am so excited to talk to all of you, and I'm so excited that we get a chance to work on this. So yay, nice to meet y'all. All right, do we wanna go start and go, about, go around and introduce ourselves quickly also, my panelists, and say what you do, who you are, how awesome you are, brag about yourself, go ahead. Um, okay, I'll go first. 
Um, so I'm Michael. I'm subtle, uh, at present. Uh, it's 1 a.m. in Malaysia, um, and I'm a New Zealand educator who's actually based in Iskander Puteri at a uh, British private school, and I'm a chemistry and physics teacher who incorporates both gamification and game-based learning into my lessons. Yeah. I'll go. I'm Melissa Pilikowski. I'm in Nebraska in the United States, and I teach uh, 11th grade, 12th grade English language arts, which stretches both Britlet. Um, I do college composition for a local college and teach it in my high school. And then I also do kind of applied communications for my students who are looking to go straight into the job world, straight into the military. So I use gamification and game-based learning to kind of hit all of the levels of students that I have. Okay, I'll go. So this is Sherry Jones. Um, I am a philosophy and game studies professor at Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. And I have a connection with Melissa and I also teach uh, rec comp. So I do teach that at the college level. And because of the, the discipline I'm teaching, I, I examine game not only in terms of game design, but I also examine the effect of games on culture, on philosophy and economics and so forth. So it's a very wide ranging topic that I teach. Yogesh, are you able to connect with us via any sound? I don't think so. Yeah. We can see your little your little icon saying you're here. So if you want to type in the box, we can talk for you if you have anything you want to say, because I type faster than I talk. OK, awesome. All right, Steve, let's go on to the first question. OK, so this is this is the money question. Um, you know, we mentioned this earlier. And uh, I'm sort of a, a stickler when it comes to ensuring that we don't use these two terms uh, interchangeably, which often happens. But I'd love to hear uh, from our panelists, you know, their take on the difference between gamification and game-based learning um, so we can set the stage, you know, in terms of, of, of the differences. So maybe Michael, if you want to start us off. Yeah, I guess... Um... Uh, hopefully I'm close to uh, everyone else's definitions, but I, I guess I see gamification as using game-based elements uh, in kind of a, a non-game context. So for example, in my classes, I use badges, um, kind of different leveling up, so differentiating class, uh, the students, so they, they work on different levels. Uh, whereas the game-based learning aspects is, is the apps like Kahoot or Quizzes, um, we are actually using games to drive the learning. Uh, I've also been a bit of beta testing around uh, especially chemistry and physics um, apps, which add the, the game-based elements, but they're, they're more gamification in a way. Um, they're not really games per se. Yeah, so hopefully that's, that's well, that's what, how I see gamification and game-based learning and the distinction. So hopefully we kind of uh, have similar ideas around that. How about you, Melissa? Um, yeah, really similar. I see game-based learning, I always view as the execution of how my students are going to learn a certain topic or learn a certain skill. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, we used Super Fight with my college comp students as a way to teach them the different parts of argumentation, the claim, the data, um, the warrant counter argument. So it's kind of how they learn. And then I use gamification such as class craft or adding narrative and quests as more of a culture building, more of an engagement and more of how content is distributed to students. So, you know, for example, um, this week we're kind of doing a ticket to ride incentive and I have tickets, ticket images hidden within powered or slide decks or hidden within their lessons. And if they click on them, then there's a spe special message of a code or something that they can do to win a ticket to earn XP or to fill up their HP or, you know, some kind of a little advantage to them. So it's not a huge game piece, but it's just a little 
quirk just to keep everyone interested and just keep engagement and fun high. How about you, Sherry? Thanks. So I agree with both Michael and Melissa. Uh, uh, specifically, though, that the way I think of gamification in a very simple way is just applying game elements in, uh, to real life environments. Uh, and what we mean by game elements are really just rules. So we're applying more rules on real life environments or virtual environments. And I've done gamification because I used to run a MOOC massively open online course where I applied gamification uh, with 700 plus students and that's what we did. But I don't uh, specifically emphasize on um, points because you'll hear me later talk about this, which I'm having a lot of problem with uh, uh, pointification. That's a problem. Um, ethically speaking, it's a problem. Um, so I focus on role playing. Um, I, I focus on skill building, but I try to avoid some of the elements of gamification because of ethical concerns. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to hear you bring that part up. I, I use that term pointification often. Uh, I kind of think of pointification as, as what we commonly know of as um, school. And, you know, so I do also agree that we need to be careful because, you know, school, you know, at the, at the barest, we could consider it a, a game. It's a pretty poor example of a game. But I, and I also agree strongly with the RPG or, or role playing piece. Uh, for me, like Melissa mentioned, choice uh, is a huge part or, or quest based learning for me is like where it really gets important because then kids are, are navigating their own way through the course um, by choosing what they want to work on and that kind of thing. So, so I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, and it kind of scares me sometimes when we get into too much of like the pure behavior management side of, of gamification. So um, I value everything everybody shared already. And uh, Ashley, I don't know if you want to add a little bit to that conversation. Um, I have to say, I, probably, I agree with all of you. And like, for me, in my classroom, I like to use levels and badges and have them have their own side quests that lead to their own learning. And I love using game based learning as well. Like I'm a Kahoot fan. I love quizzes. It's all my favorite. So it's like anything I can do to make it easier and fun is great. Um, I know Yogesh is attached to our um, online Twitter comment. I wanna make sure that he got a chance to, to be, I'm gonna be his voice for him. Um, he His background is he's been teaching for biology k-12 for 18 years and he uses gamification also so if anybody has any comments for him or things they want to add into it i'll be going back and forth with him on twitter to make sure that y'all can get a chance to talk to him as well so with that that'd probably be a great lead-in for our next question so for panelists anyone who wants to respond how did you guys get started with gamifying your learning experience was there like any approach you use that you liked best how to like what how to come about and like why is it important to you as an educator Okay, I'll start again. Um, yeah, well, I went to university uh, with Rachel Bolstad at the New Zealand Educational Research Foundation, and we actually ended up bumping up each to, uh, up, or bumping into each other at a conference uh, later, and Shed moved on into educational research and gamification and game-based learning. And she was looking especially around motivating boys in education, and uh, kind of they tend to be more competitive, maybe it's a controversial comment, but still. Um, and I was having real problems with my class at the time around motivation. So by incorporating game-based elements uh, to the lessons, I found that actually drove a majority of, of the boys uh, forward. But it, it was interesting though with the pointification aspect, um, work for some boys, but then if you're at the bottom, then it's not motivating at all. So. Um, I've kind of developed my approach to gamification, uh, especially, um, and seeing it now more as a way for the students to um, experience um, real world context, but only in the classroom, in a way. Um, so that it also is, is leading obviously onto game-based learning as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so my, my initial approaches were a way to motivate boys, especially, um, and now it's kind of evolved into more uh, a way to, for the students to experience real world context in maybe a more game based, um, safer environment. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll go next. And it was some of the gamification was just a topic that I'd heard about and it intrigued me. I'd always 
thought that having fun and just being active in the classroom was important. And I just set off on my own to learn about gamification. So I think I watched and read anything that Dr. Chris Haskell had ever created online and some of the others too. And I started just kind of a pilot with one of my classes using 3D Game Lab. And, um, you know, it, it was a first time good effort, but I realized, I mean, I think my first goal was I wanted students to kind of self pace and that worked okay, but I didn't have enough choices for them, one. And two, I realized that earning points and badges weren't motivating for every student. And I think that was kind of a wake up call for me. And after that, that next year was when I launched Classcraft. And even though they didn't have the quest, the quest at the time, um, I still used it just in my own classroom and just kept creating games that my students could play, especially related to vocabulary and what, whatever it was that we were reading. And it's just evolved since then. And just with the help of everyone on Twitter, um, you know, a lot of talking with Steve, with Matt Farber, reading a lot of the books and everything out there. And it's just evolved since then. But I mean, it just kind of started as my own little rabbit hole that I went down and then exploded. Okay, so I'll go next. So um, I've been doing game vacation and game based learning for a very, very long time. I, I, I've been doing it for the last eight years. Um, and what is specifically, well, game-based learning, right now my focus is on game-based learning. So I do use commercial games, which I forgot to mention earlier. I mean, we, we use Fallout Shelter, we use Observer, we use Detention for the current learning. But in terms of gamification, what I'm fascinated with gamification is the role-playing aspect and the narrative aspect of gamification. Because we are trying to apply a narrative layer, at least the way I approach it, is to apply a narrative layer onto a real world environment or a virtual environment such as an LMS, okay? And why do we do this is because for me, role playing helps students understand perspectives. So if they role play as a character, which they're gonna base the, the character design based on research, they can actually understand what the character goes through or based on the ethos, the character, um, the character's personality and their interests and their values, they will behave in certain ways in certain situations. That's one way we do it. Another way is that I've actually built uh, gamification for an Indian, uni Indian university where we are using gamification for job training. So for an example, instead of just telling students what exactly is the function and responsibility of a bioethicist, we actually tell them to role play as a bioethicist and explain to them what the functions and responsibilities are and put them in a difficult, tough situation where they have to perform those functions and responsibilities to get a sense of actually what that profession does. The third thing I actually do is that I've been building uh, escape rooms, but specifically mixed reality escape rooms. So mixed reality is where we use digital games as well as the, the physical environment to help students solve puzzles. And the last one I did was actually based on Orwell's 1984, uh, the timing is, is right before the election, actually. <laughs> so I did that particular one to teach um, the, the philosophy of utilitarianism using that escape room, but that was designed for adults. So um, I think it's very important because of the perspective earning and also the empathy. And empathy does, really does not come unless you put it into practice. Hey, Yogi yeah. Ash, we're excited to see you. We want to catch you up. We are on question number two. We're talking about like, <laughs> what got you started in gamification and why it's important for you as an educator. So if you want to jump in and I introduced you, I, I, we were tweeting back and forth. I told the group, but if, oh, he's gone. Man, that stinks. Uh, it does stink. Uh, Maybe aw. he'll, uh, Hopefully he'll oh, be wait, back. but you know what? But there is, it said, here you go. I'll, 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 I'll speak for Yogesh this time. Thank you. In, in our Twitter um, conversation, he said, I started because students enjoy this type of learning. It is important because it makes things easier for students as well as, as teachers. Um, 
So that's uh, there we go from you get Yogesh. Um, I also kind of like to tell my my story of of getting started. Um, kind of like Sherry, uh, game based learning has been at the heart of everything I do. From gosh, I mean, for a very long time. Also, uh, mainly because it just made sense. I mean, I started uh, my my wife and I opened a, a computer training and gaming center uh, about twenty years ago, and we had the opportunity there to offer creative approaches to learning things with technology. <laughs> and it made perfect sense to incorporate games um, in a learning environment. Uh, primarily then it was because we knew we wanted to appeal to both the kids that we were trying to attract to our programs, as well as the parents. So we were sort of getting them for both sides in a sense with, with games. Um, and it really worked out well, uh, which led to, to you know, where I am now teaching. But in terms of more of a pure gamification thing, uh, kind of like Melissa, uh, Chris Haskell was probably one of my first introductions. Um, and, you know, I, I met him a long time ago at the Games in Ed uh, Symposium and got introduced to 3D Game Lab as well. And what was really cool was I participated at the time that I decided with my school district to go into um, using 3D Game Lab, I was able to register for their one of their teacher camps. So in the teacher camp, I was learning just awesome, fun technology stuff like machinima and all these great things. But in a quest-based, XP-based, you know, gamified environment. And quite honestly, and it's funny because there's a lot of, um, it's easy to question the motivation side. Um, quite honestly, I was excited to, you know, earn some of the badges and complete some of the quests for that reason, you know, and granted, I was having fun and learning great stuff. But, uh, but it, it is, you know, there is some motivation there that I don't think we could discount. Um, but the at the heart of it was that choice based piece, which I think really resonated with me. So when I did start, I, <laughs> I first started trying to just add some optional quests to my class where it was like this extra credit type thing and quickly learned that wasn't really, it was too separated from what we were doing. So the following year I said, you know what, I'm going full, you know, all in with uh, quest-based learning and 3D game lab. And when I completely turned my class into like a choice-based environment and still used all those other gamification elements, it really, really made sense. Um, and, and now it's really neat to see because again, back with that choice piece, my kids, you know, and, and it's funny, Sherry said role-playing and I, I didn't really think of, you know, I think of role playing from like the game master teacher type thing. But what I forget is that in my class, my kids are all playing the role of true game designer in a game development studio because of the way the course is set up. So that contributes to that as well. Uh, but it's really neat to see the kids choosing and taking their path. And, and I get to help kids and just support them in different things. And it makes my day very exciting because I might be working with one kid on a, you know, command blocks in, in Minecraft and another kid's deciding to try to learn unity and, you know, all this neat stuff. So that's sort of my, you know, how I got into it. And uh, it's been, you know, no turning back. That's for sure. I love how, how even though we all have very different stories, they all kind of con converge at the same idea, which is, I think, it basically like the tenet of why we all do games and education or gamify education. Um, we had a really good question from one of our, our participants. Andrew wants to know if we could elaborate, you guys, since, I mean, I want to know what you say about pointification and what pointification is and why we have such strong feelings about it. So, I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in on that one just because I feel very strongly. And, and um, so pointification, in other words, when we simply give sort of like points as a reward for things, it's not very different, in my opinion, from giving them participation points or a grade in class and all of that stuff. So it's really just we can kind of say it's gamification, but it's, in my opinion, it, it's not and and what 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 I guess I'm most afraid of is that when we then latch on to saying we're applying gamification and we're kind of doing it very poorly, I think we're disparaging the the potential for good gamification. So I'll jump in because I like Steve. I really 
do <laughs> feel very strongly about this topic, just kind of bleed into our, our next question regarding the ethics of, of gamification. But gamification is actually different from pointsification, it's different from playification, and it's actually different from ludification, okay? And I did a lot of research in this field, so pointsification is a term that actually was a term that, that was created by Margaret Robertson, uh, and it was in 2010 when the, first, when the work came out. And it's basically an accusation that if you just use points to measure the student's success, it's not really understanding the full potential of a game because a game has narrative, a game have other elements like mechanics and also, you know, other elements that that uh, encourage the student to learn. So if we just look at students as numbers, and I think in the media we have heard assessing people as numbers, okay, there is a problem with just using numbers, a data to drive our understanding of people. Um, and what we're doing with pointsification is to measure students just based on points, which um, it's not really sufficient. The other term really quick is uh, playification, which is another group of folks who thinks that when we do gamification, um, that it should be fun. Now there are educators who say, why does gamification have to be fun? So that was an interesting conversation when they go, no, we would just wanna give them rules and we want them to follow and they learn something from the outcome. But there's another group who say, no, we want fun in gamification. So they decide to call that playification. Then naturally ludification is just straight up a game, the full amount of game. And technically gamification, if we're trying to divorce the term from the business connotation of what gamification is, we really should be calling it ludification because lud ludic, you know, it, it's really a game, but gamification has negative connotation from the business world, which we will talk a little more later. Steve, you're still muted. <laughs> Thanks. I was trying to get to our other, our next question. So, uh, oh, excellent. Perfect so, lead in. I think so. Yeah. So, um, and this, this leads right, you might as well just pitch this one, lob this one right at Sherry. Um, given the gamification is a method that began in the business world for the purpose of maximizing productivity, efficiency, and profit, do you have any concerns <laughs> about the ethics of gamified learning approach? And what methods have you developed to address these concerns? So let's go back to, like you said, the business uh, and why, you know, like Starbucks or whomever gives you, you know, points for this and that. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. So gamification has a very long history. It did not come from academia. It came from the business world. And the whole point was to use points, use badges, use levels, whatever, to maximize, to trick the employee, to do more for the company, to maximize profit, to maximize efficiency. So therefore, what are we doing as educators when we use gamification without understanding the ramification of the act? Because what we're doing is trying to maximize some kind of efficiency, but undergo or dismiss students' uh, um, intrinsic desire to learn. Now, I'll give you one example. So this might not apply to educators who's, who's not in the U.S., but in the United States, we have a law called the FERPA law, right? So the FERPA law is the Family Educational Act. Um, but it basically protects student data, okay? It protects student data. So as educators, at least in college, I cannot share students' grades with parents. I cannot share their points at all with anybody besides the student themselves. So the real question is, when we, even if we say, okay, student, you earn a thousand points when you do this activity under the gamify field, FERPA might see that as saying, wow, you're actually publicizing the students grade in front of everybody else. That's a real ethical concern. So what we're doing is, hey, we're going to show everybody everyone's grade without concern of students' privacy. We're going, this is how much you earn. This is the level you get. So in that sense, if we don't understand that gamification originally was a way to force the employees to compete with each other. So when we do the same thing in education, we're saying, okay, Johnny, you got 500 points, but Jennifer over there got, uh, you know, 1,011 points, so she must be better than you. Those are the hidden messages that we are giving to students when we use points. So I do use badges in gamification, but the way the student earn badges, I kind of follow the Boy Scout, Girl Scout method, which is that they achieve a skill so they get a badge. Instead of saying, because of all the points you earn, therefore you got a badge. So I'm trying to stay 
really, really far away from points as much as possible. <laughs> wow, that, that's really interesting because I do use points and it just makes me at least question, I mean, that's, you know, there's much more to it than just points. I mean, points in my case are still demonstrating that they accomplished something like a badge. Uh, it just happens to have an experience point value with it. And I, I can't help but just throw out there as to, you know, it, it's very interesting, the, the uh, competition side. I mean, when we're talking about games and gamification, there is definitely the potential for even encouraging competition. So um, I'll just leave that out there for the other, uh, you know, participants as well. I value very much what you're saying about the, uh, the ethical concerns there and, and sometimes question whether there's a way we could have kids opt in it or out of the competitive side because I think that is a big concern. Yeah, and I think that that competitive side is definitely something I see in my classroom. And um, that's why I, I have a hard time personally um, really directly connecting XP with the grades. And I really, my XP and my grades really have little to do with each other, um, especially because with using Classcraft and I use they all have the leaderboard. But I think competition can be a scary thing too because some students are really motivated by the competition it, and it can be fun and it can be great. But there is a danger in some kids who are not motivated by the competition. And that's something that I've, I um, wonder a lot lately. And it's finding that sweet spot. Um, if I, really lay off the competition, which, you know, I've had some years where I have not let students do too many competitions with each other. And some kids really feel, you know, they want that. But I have some kids who are afraid of that, who aren't comfortable with it. And that's something that I'm still not satisfied with my with in my classroom because I want it to be a place where they're all comfortable, but also where they're all motivated. But I think that that can easily become a danger too if everything becomes a competition in classrooms that some kids start to back away. One thing I do like about, like say for example, quizzes, I always shut off the leaderboard when I do quizzes because some kids are not comfortable. They don't want to s people to see their names at the bottom of that leaderboard. And for me, quizzes is not supposed to be a competition. It's supposed to be, where are you at right now? Or like if we're studying vocabulary, that it's just a practice of using those words, that extra repetition of seeing those words. So, you know, again, it's knowing that chemistry of the class and, you know, I think, Steve, like you said, maybe letting kids opt out of certain competitions where some kids are not motivated by it. Yeah, the, the quizzes thing's an interesting one because I do use it uh, a lot in class. Uh, the kind of compromise I've done is I, I have only the top five. And so I also do the, the quizzes basically at the start of the units and at the end of the unit. So I can also see whether there's been a uh, improvement in their learning, but it's, that's basically based on the individual. So it's motivating for the individual possibly. But I guess this is also where gamification, game-based learning kind of uh, the, the role-playing aspect as well. Uh, so that's kind of how I've evolved. I started using it as a way to do assessment, and now I've kind of moved on to see it more as a way of students can be a research chemist. So I have different tasks which they can do, like a titration, where they're working on it in a virtual environment, but they're playing the role of a research chemist and how that research chemist would do that chemical procedure. So it's kind of how I've kind of tried to develop a compromise. So I also need assessment data for, for the school. So yeah, it's, it's always a compromise.
we had some really good questions from our audience and I wanted to make sure that I got a chance to address them with you guys. Um, the first one we had was from Francis Pena. Um, Francis said, what do you think that the is the next or deeper level of gamification research? Do you think it would be, be beneficial to research the video game design principles and mechanics that make games engaging, challenging, and fun, and at times presents multiple entry points, and trying to implement those principles and mechanics into classroom practices and strategies? I, I, I'm sure he's going to answer this one way better than me, but, uh, but I, I would like to say that I think at the core you know, the heart of gamification, I think that is the goal is to bring in, you know, um, you know, game design research and principles and that that's what gamification should be based on. So hopefully that's what we're all drawing from and that's what the research is drawing from. And I'll add on to what Steve said. Um, I really think at the core of gamification really is that narrative element, okay, the narrative element. Because when we say mechanics, they're just little tools. They really don't have any meaning in and of themselves. So you use those elements because you're trying to promote a particular narrative that you want to immerse your students in. I'll give you guys one example of an experiment that was done in 1971 that's not called gamification, but it certainly is gamification. So, uh, the Stanford uh, psychology professor, Philip Zambardo, famously created the Stanford prison experiment. That's a gamification situation where he gamified the classroom, asked some students to play prisoners, some, some students to play wardens, and the wardens actually beat up the prisoners. So what, what, what do I think that the, the future of this gamification research has to go? First of all, we really need to concern ourselves with what kind of narrative we are trying to tell our students. We are responsible for that. So, for example, beyond academia, we have people doing gamification like, like um, LARPers, okay? LARPer, life role-playing uh, gamers who are, who are pretending as if, Hitler never, uh, Hitler won, the Nazis actually took over, so they actually role play these kind of scenarios. So as teachers, we need to consider what kind of narrative are we telling our students and what kind of outcome do we want to achieve from that? So the research might be looking into the psychology of gamification, right? The, the of course, because I'm in philosophy, the ethics of gamification. That's the direction I'm going to go, but I don't want to make too many conclusions because, again, we need to do research in those fields to understand what the actual effects are. Any other thoughts? Okay, we have two more amazing questions on our, on our actual tweet chat. Um, we had a question around um, badges and, and how. So it says, um, these are kind of two questions that relate. Can you give an example of a way that badge might be earned? Is it skill-based, behavior-based, et cetera? And then, Makai ties in the same thing. If everyone earns the same value for the same task, does it have the same potential issues? Because now the sum is more important than the number of tasks completed and less how well they completed or if someone is better than the others. So anyone, anyone who's used badge, badgeification or like, you know, earning badges or like, like what do y'all take on this from your perspective? Because I think that's basically they want to know how do they earn badges? What, what's the difference between badges and points and, and the game? But like what, like if, if we all get the same points, how is it different? Well, for me, when it comes to, to badging, uh, if I'm going to use badges, the badges represent um, maybe, com you know, sort of completing a, 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 a conglomerate of, quests or something that kind of demonstrate, hey, I earned the game designer badge because I did all the incremental steps to get up to that. And then that was the, you know, that's what I earned by getting there. Incrementally, they might have earned experience points along the way for each quest that led up to that. Um, that's how I see it. It's also a nice, you know, culmination of a quest line, you know, as I see it. Uh, and also hopefully the badge represents mastery of something that they can say, hey, you know, now that I earned this badge, you know, maybe I can assist others because I've already demonstrated this mastery or, you know, something like that is where I think the badges uh, become valuable. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm not one that uses badges, but my thoughts on badges are very similar to Steve's. I think they're the most powerful when the badge is one, not something that's earned by everyone, and two, represents some type of skill that they've achieved. And I think, you know, I know there are some schools out there that they have badging where once they've completed a skill such as coding, you know, then they can serve as student experts and help other students and sometimes even other teachers with those certain areas. So I think, you know, when badges are really integrated into a school system and really represents student learning and not just the mandated curriculum. I think that that's where the power of them really comes out. Yeah, I'd have to, to agree. Um, I, I think it's also a way to show students can become leaders and develop those leadership skills because they, they develop mastery in a particular topic. And as, as, as both of you have said, um, it allows them to become kind of co-teachers to actually assist others who are struggling to kind of uh, develop their understanding of, of the topic. So it's, it's a great way to, to show or give students um, um, ownership and um, also leadership in the classroom. Awesome. I think this is kind of a great lead into our next question, which is, how do you try and develop more intrinsic student-centered motivation while using gamification approaches in the classroom? Because we've got a comment going on a sidebar about how whether um, gamification is extrinsic motivation and game-based learning is intrinsic or what the benefits are and how they relate. So maybe we can kind of segue that into this question about how, once again, developing how you try and develop more intrinsic student-centered centered motivation using gamification and how you do it. Maybe, maybe I'll start. Um, let me bring it all back because I'm going to sound kind of annoying about the role playing. I, I, I wrote a book chapter <laughs> for IGI Global uh, titled uh, Designing Seamless Learning Using Role Playing Experiences. Okay, so I have a bias here for role playing. But let me give you an example of what we do. For example, if you teach an English course, for those who teach English course, this is very relevant to you. So when we try to get students to engage with a text, okay, when they're doing a reading, we want the students to role play a bit with that. So for example, in my classes, I might ask one student to be the in framer. So the in framer does this thing. The in framer's role is to find a specific passage in the book that is worth discussing for the classmates. So they highlight the important part for a classmate to discuss. We have, for example, a questioner. A questioner is a person who posts questions regarding the text or that if a character in the text asks a hard question, they might ask themselves, okay, if I were in the same situation, would I, how would I answer that question that is posed to uh, the person, the, the character, in the book. Now, how does that tie to intrinsic motivation? Intrinsic motivation really has to do with one's interests, one's values and one's interests. So when we say values in philosophy, what we mean is that value means the, the things that I think is the right thing to do and the things that I think is the wrong thing to do, okay? So let's say, for example, a student believes that it is wrong to hurt animals. And in the story, the character decides to hurt an animal, we get the student to reflect on that and discuss, okay, how would I address this? And what exactly is my values that made me react this way to the book? So it's actually using that role-playing design to make them role-play and think about text in many different directions. And that kind of ties into their own moral values and so forth. I think another way that gamification can really impact the intrinsic motivation is through all of the choices that students can make. When students play a video game and they progress through that video game, they have first, they have the choices of even though they may all have to get through this world, there might be different paths through that world or they have different choices of ways that they can go through that world. Second, they have control over the pacing. Even if there's a deadline, they can spend more time in this area or this area and they can, or they can go straight through. And that's something that I really try to emphasize and maximize on in my classes is that 
teaching ELA, there are certain things that we all eventually have to get through at the end. Right now, we all have to get through writing a research paper. That, that's what it has to be. But students have the choice of what they want to write about. Students can progress through those stop points at their own speeds, whether it takes them 30 minutes to write an introduction or 10 minutes to write an introduction, and then they can move on when they're ready. So, you know, these elements of video game mechanics can, I think, easily be applied to the classroom and become very intrinsically motivated to, motivating to students, too. Yeah, I would have to agree in terms of choice. To me, that's the one thing that helps allow us to um, to encourage intrinsic motivation. When we can help kids find their passion and find their interest, as Melissa said, um, kind of like how I guess for for Sherry, the uh, narrative is the 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 leading part. For me, it's uh, the choice, but I and narrative is very important. Um, but that choice piece is where I see you know, kids really getting to the intrinsic, which is why I'm always a little fearful of the, you know, like we talked about pointification and such. Um, also, I want to make just one little, we're running long time. There's one, one thing I just want to kind of point out when we talk about game-based learning, um, because, you know, the most examples, and it's certainly an example, are things like quizzes and, and things like that. But I want to you know, kind of go to the core of, you know, game-based learning is also, is primarily the idea of learning through you know the game itself so uh for the audience just to keep in mind too that when you talk about game-based learning let's say you're using the game civilization to teach about ancient history you know the learning that happens from experiencing that is a big part of game-based learning as well i just want to make sure that doesn't get overshadowed um thanks yeah i guess touching on that as well the the idea that the intrinsic motivation doesn't necessarily have to be about the interest the students already bring to the table. The game could actually introduce concepts and ideas that they have no idea about. And then that game can then introduce them to a whole new world and a whole new looking, looking at the world in a completely different way. So intrinsic motivation doesn't have to be about the student's interest to start off with. It could actually be a, a way to develop their interest in something they've never even considered. We seem to be having like a ton of great side conversations in our in our ch chat and also things like so if if possible if you are um following us on twitter please add everyone into this, this your follow us make a conversation with us we can keep some of these conversations going on the side because we just got our our six minute warning that we have six minutes left of work conversation so and, yeah and and our final question is definitely one worth running through the whole group because i think it'll be helpful for for those watching um you know, let's talk about suggestions for people who want to get started in either game-based learning or gamification, uh, you know, to give people a little kickstart after our session. Um, I, I guess the, the idea of the game-based learning, um, and I guess I'll go this from Rachel back in New Zealand as well, <clears throat> a lot of indigenous New Zealand uh, learning um, for before Europeans arrived was very game and play-based. Um, and also around, again, the role, role playing as well. You could be like, um, a, an example could be you, you were a kind of a, a leader in the tribe. You could role play that. Um, so it doesn't actually have to always have to involve technology, even though we're act, actually adding gamification for the aspect of technology. You don't have to play games uh, with tech. Um, so you can go low tech. And you don't have to, yeah, focus on the tech. Just keep it simple to start off with. That's probably my, my advice. I'll add a bit about the game-based learning, why I'm, I'm doing more of game-based learning than gamification now. Um, th th they're both the same I in terms of there's a narrative because of the way I think about them is that they are narratives and uh, games are just a, uh, another form of media or another form of literature. So from the English side, we see them as another form of literature. I mean, back in the day, 
film studies was not very welcomed until much later. So film was another medium that people studied, okay? So when we get game, what's the difference between other media such as television, film, or, or book that students are, are reading is that, that when they're actually in a digital game or a board game, whatever that they are playing, that they are actually experiencing the situation and that if they make the wrong decision, they cannot really progress in the game. That's the whole point of getting them to play in a game. So why do we want to put them in a digital game is that they are learning to follow the rules and afterwards reflect on whether or not the rules are, for example, ethical or not. Are they problematic or not? What did I just play? Did the game just actually tell me to shoot the guy? Is that actually what I'm supposed to be doing? If I shot the person, I could progress in the game, but should I have done that in reality? Those are the kind of questions, right, that I want the students to actually engage with uh, when they uh, play a game. So, so that's, my, that's my reason for using games is because we throw them in the narrative, force them to experience it, and make them reflect on what just happened to themselves. In, you know, real, real simple advice I'll, I'll give in terms of um, getting started would be, uh, you know, Melissa mentioned it earlier, and it's been my go to is get involved uh, in the conversations on Twitter. The one of the things that's really, uh, you know, I've really valued is, is I find that the, the educators that are interested in gamification, game based learning happen to be the most generous, wonderful group, primarily because they're so passionate and want to share that passion. Uh, but they're all out there. And I mean, when you start, you know, kind of just going down the rabbit hole, uh, there are people there to kind of support and, and guide you all along the way. So, I mean, it's really about getting started. Um, you know, if it's game-based learning, bring one game into your classroom that you think supports your curriculum or can help you, you know, kind of teach a concept um, in a very authentic way. If it's gamification, you know, get started, but, but, but do look for that support because um, I think we need each other <laughs> in this. Uh, and we've all learned so much from each other, you know, as we've been going. And I know that I've taken so many turns and twists and turns and such because of that. And that's been, um, you know, been a, a savior for sure. All right, it is unfortunately time to say goodbye, everyone. I'm getting the, the two minutes to stop. So let's take care of this and be very good hosts to our next, to our next host. So thank you each one, every one of you. Steve and I, I know I'm gonna speak for both of us. We've enjoyed this chat, it has been amazing. Um, people who are in the audience, if you wanna follow us, I've just tweeted, please follow us all. I'm at Teacher Steel. You can find all of us. We all posted our, our hashtags and tweets and blah, blah, blah in the, the comments. Mm -hmm. And it has been a great pleasure to speak to each of you. And seriously, I can't wait to connect with you more. Agreed. Awesome. Have a great rest of your day, all, or, and Michael, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sleep.